Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Um, let me begin by saying it's a privilege, joy, and honor that Yeshua the Messiah has given me to be able to be here with you today and be a part of this conference. And um, I have been blessed by the first three messages that I've heard. And I pray that you have been blessed as well. And it was the wisdom of God that uh, today this conference has been done this way uh, because just as it was spoken, you're going to get different levels and aspects of the Babylonian system because it's so uh, multifaceted and, and covers so many things. Um, you have heard from these three speakers characteristics and aspects and elements of what Babylon is. And you have heard elements and aspects uh, regarding what it means to come out of Babylon. So I'm going to give you uh, some different angles and elements and aspect of it. But everything that you heard today, um, what you have heard and what you're going to be hearing from me, are all a part of explaining to you the Babylonian system and what Yah is saying and what it means to come out of her, my people. Okay, so uh, the gifting, the style that I have is a systematic teacher. And so um, how I do the teaching is um, I try to establish a foundation first and, and, and give you definitions of things try to share and explain to you principles. And the farther we go in the teaching, the more the teaching is meant to bring everything together. And I usually uh, try to tell you up front um, what I'm going to share and do uh, to help you uh, to be cognizant and aware of what you're going to be listening to and what you're going to be learning. So I'm going to try to explain to you um, more characteristics and things that are associated with the Babylonian system, all right? So one of the things I want to share with you that probably most don't make a connection to is how we connect Babylon to the Torah, and ultimately, I want to give you first a definition of what Babylon is. And so in order to share with you that definition, um, I want to read from Genesis chapter 11, verse 5, 8, and 9. It says, uh, Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the, men, which the children of men builded. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from there upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. This is Nimrod building what's called the Tower of Babel. So Genesis 11 verse 9 is a word play in the Hebrew. It says, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because Yahweh did confound the language of all the earth. And so... Where we have in Genesis 11 verse 9, Babel, it's the Strong's number 894. And we render this Babylon. And Babel, or we say in English Babylon, this is literally what the Strong's definition gives for it. Confusion by mixing. So fundamentally... Babylon means to mix because Babel comes from the Hebrew word Balal. Babel comes from the Hebrew word Balal, which means to mix, mingle, confuse, or confound. So there's a word play here in Genesis 11, 9. Um, they called it Babel, which means to mix because the Lord did mix the languages. Here it's translated as uh, confound. And of course, when he did that, uh, they were confused. They couldn't communicate with each other anymore. So in the bigger picture, 
we have the ways of the God of Israel, which is the Torah, which is called the kingdom of light. And opposing his kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. And the basic name of the kingdom of darkness is Babylon. And the characteristic of it is mixing. So God is trying to show us these two kingdoms, the difference in the differentiation between them going clear back to the Garden of Eden. Because to represent them, we're told about two trees in the garden. One's the tree of life. Well, the tree of life personifies the Torah and following the Torah. Because in Proverbs chapter 3, uh, the subject of Proverbs chapter 3 is the Torah. In verse 1, my son, forget not my Torah, but let your heart keep my commandments. Then it says in verse 18, she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retains her, referring to the Torah. And so the Torah just means the teaching or the instruction of the God of Israel. It's just generic. He's teaching. It doesn't say what he's teaching by just using the word Torah, but it just means his teaching, his instruction. And so the other tree that's represented is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what fundamentally is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It's mixing good and evil. And so that's Babylon, that's mixture. And why were we told that we're not to eat of that tree? Now, eating of it is just a poetic way of saying becoming one with it, being a part of it, participating in it. You know, because I don't know if you how you think of eating, but whenever you eat something, you become one with what you eat. It goes into your body and it becomes a part of you. All right. And so the reason is, is when good and evil is mixed, it causes you to not have proper discernment. It causes you to not have the discernment of the heart and the mind of God. And he wants you to have his heart and his mind whenever you make perpetual decisions in your life. Okay, so. Uh, the next thing we want to uh, share uh, regarding uh, Babylon is Lucifer. Hasatan is called the king of Babylon. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 4. Take up a proverb against the king of Babylon. And it goes on to say in verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. And so Hasatan, Lucifer is the king over that Babylonian system. And so his method is to mix, to confuse. That's his method. All right? So um, whenever you go to war, in order to be properly prepared, you need to know two things. You need to know what you're doing, what your plan is offensively, but you also need to study the enemy and the tactics and the ways of your enemy. And so if you can recognize that the method by which Hasatan operates uh, to cause you to be quote-unquote confused is he's going to do it through the process of mixture. All right. Uh, and then the next thing um, I want to share with you is I want to make a connection of Babylon to Esau. All right. And the book of Lamentations is written by Jeremiah. And he was lamenting what? The destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish people going to Babylon. So the book was to lament those things. And so in um, Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21, it says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Eden. Edom. Daughter of Edom. And then Lamentations chapter 4, verse 22. O daughter of Zion, 
he will no more carry you into captivity. So he's speaking to his people, and he's referring to his people as Zion, Zion in Hebrew, the daughter of Zion. And he's saying um, that he who carried you into captivity will not do it anymore, and he's going to judge those that took you into captivity. That was Babylon. He will visit your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover your sins. And so who was it that took the Jewish people into captivity? It was the Babylonians. So in referring to what the Babylonians did in Lamentations chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, as I've just shared and read to you, the Babylonians are called a daughter of Edom or Esau. Okay, so this goes back to the Torah. This goes back to Edom or Esau. And so, in characteristically describing Edom or Esau, now, um, I hope to show this to you, is, you remember in Exodus chapter 4, verse, let's look at it, um, Exodus chapter 4, and uh, verse 22, you will say unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. I say unto you, let my son go that he may serve you. If you will refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay your son, even your firstborn. So it was a battle between firstborns. And so um, ultimately, the fight or the conflict that is a part of this world that we are a part of, um, if you take it back, um, Lucifer rebelled and instigated a a rebellion of the heavenly host. And actually, if you study it out, he rebelled against the place and the position that God the Father put Yeshua. He rebelled against the place and the position that God the Father put Yeshua. Now, because he attacked that place and the position, ultimately he was attacking... God the Father, but the attack of God the Father was expressed through the attack of Yeshua. All right? And so, um, the God of Israel said He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, He has a firstborn in the earth by which He's executing His plan. And that's Jacob. Um, But the enemy... Hasatan, he also has a firstborn by which he's trying to execute his plan. And you know the agent by whom Hasatan works with to execute his plan? It's Esau. And so it's a battle of Hasatan opposing the place and the position that God the Father um, put Yeshua. And that battle is being expressed through their agents through their respective firstborns. All right? And uh, so now, I want to go to Psalm chapter 2. And in Psalm chapter 2, uh, we have, beginning in verse 1, because I'm, I'm outlining in the big picture this, the spiritual battle, who it's between. It says, Psalm chapter 2, Beginning in verse 1, Why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against His Messiah, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So the kings of the earth are in opposition to God the Father in Yeshua. And the kings of the earth doesn't want any part of the ways and the purposes and the things of God the Father and Yeshua expressed through the words, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Do you see this being manifested in the world in which you live in? That they don't, um, that the kings of the earth, the, the governments of the world, uh, particularly the Western world, 
um, uh, they're not trying to have a society um, that operates under Judeo-Christian values. They're, they're actually rejecting and speaking and opposing them, and they want to have a world independent of the God of Israel and His ways. And so you can see that rebellion happening in our world. And so here's the response of the God of Israel to the plans of the kings of the earth. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. And now, verse 6, he's going to speak of the outcome of what the kings of the earth are trying to do. I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. You see, in the original rebellion, Hasatan wanted that seat. He wanted that place. He wanted that position. And he instituted a rebellion. Um, but the outcome of the rebellion is it's going to be unsuccessful. And when the whole process is played out, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, um, as uh, an additional element and aspect of this, he put together the thought, I've set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That's Yeshua. Um, verse 7, I will declare the decree. So, in other words, God the Father put Yeshua in the place and the position over his kingdom by his decree. Now, in Hebrew, this is uh, hok. Hok means something that is not logical to everybody. And it's because he is who he is. Because he is who he is, he's allowed to do what he wants to do. And so he just decided he was going to have Yeshua to be the king over his kingdom. And not everyone agreed with his decision. And Hasatan led a rebellion against it. Okay. And so now in trying to uh, now further see who the, the kings of the earth are, um, I want uh, to go to Revelation in chapter 6 and verse 15. Revelation in uh, chapter 6 and verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And so... Who's hiding themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains? The kings of the earth. And why are they doing it? Because it goes on to say, um, they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall upon us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. In other words, the Lamb, Yeshua, is judging the kings of the earth ultimately because of their rebellion against him. And how are the kings of the earth uh, described? It says, they hide in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And so you know who that is making a hint or a reference to? Esau. Because the literal Esau... That's okay. I'm not ready for it yet. The, the literal Esau... There we go. The literal Esau lived in Mount Seir. And Mount Seir was a place of cave dwellings. And so Esau lived in the clefts of the rock and uh, in the most read book of the Bible. So I'm trying your humor on them, okay? So everybody knows what the most read book of the Bible is, right? So you tell me. Come on, tell me. What did you say, Genesis? What else did you say? John? No, Obadiah! You know why it's the most read book of the Bible? Because it's only one chapter, and you can read that one chapter, you know, in a very short period of time, and you can tell all your friends, hey, I read a book of the, of the Bible today. How'd I do? Okay. So uh, Obadiah is uh, written uh, to uh, Esau. It says, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord concerning Edom. So Genesis 36, verse 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. So the vision of Obadiah, thus is the Lord concerning Edom. Verse 3, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you that dwell in the clefts of the rock. You see, Esau is characteristically associated with living in caves or cave dwellings. So 
the kings of the earth is linked and associated with Esau. And, uh, and so, you know who the government authorities and the government leaders in the United States and in the Western world who's trying to um, have a world that they want you to live in, but it's not according to your values. Uh, biblically, do you know who those leaders are that's trying to impose their values upon you that are not your values? It's Esau. And you know what values they're trying to impose upon you? Babylonian values. Okay, so we are in a battle um, every day. We see it whenever we, um, you know, turn on the TV and the news and try to get the news from the Internet or whatnot. Um, you know, our politics is about this battle. Okay, so now, Psalm chapter 2 is quoted in Acts chapter 4. Psalm chapter 2 is quoted in Acts in chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading in verse 25. Acts chapter 4, verse 25. Who by the mouth of your servant David said, Why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That's Psalm 2.1. For the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against Yahweh and against his Messiah. That's Psalm 2.2. 2. So here is an application or an interpretation of Psalm 1 and 2 in Acts chapter 4. For of a truth against your holy child Yeshua, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. Those are the first two mentioned and given an application and an interpretation of the kings of the earth. Herod. Who's Herod? He was an Edomite. And who's Pontius Pilate? The governor of Rome. So I'm going to show you um, that Rome is associated with Esau. So in the interpretation of Psalm 2, 1 and 2 in Acts 4, the, the leaders uh, is associated with Esau. And in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, the kings of the earth is associated with being in the, uh, the caves of the rock. And that is Esau going back to Genesis 36, verse 8, and Esau, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3. See, I, I like defining everything for you, okay? So um, this is who the spiritual battle um, is with or against. It fundamentally... Um, Hasatan is working through Esau. Now, a characteristic of Esau is he hides in the field. And only through the discernment of the kingdom of light, only through the Torah can he be identified. The world at large does not identify and see Esau for who he is, but what he's trying to sell them the Babylonian system, makes sense to them. All right? And, and so the, the reason is, is you have this battle in your makeup. And so whenever you give your heart and life to the Lord, whenever you accept Yeshua as your Savior and make Him Lord of your life, the Bible says... Um, that the Spirit of God becomes alive in you. And the, the Bible describes that Spirit of God being a part of your heart. And now uh, you are in a conflict because your flesh fights against that Spirit of God that's been reborn and your carnal mind fights against it as well. So your flesh and your carnal mind is going to be connected with Esau and it's going to be connected with Babylon. And so when you come out of Babylon, you come out of the things of the flesh. When you come out of Babylon, you come out of carnal thinking. Now, what is carnal thinking? Carnal thinking is what makes sense to human logic regarding a situation wherein what makes sense in human logic is opposed to the Torah or the Word of God. 
So where human logic opposes the Torah, the word of God, it is called a carnal mind. And so now let's look what Paul said about the carnal mind in Romans in chapter 8. In verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they after the spirit, the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, do you know um, your Bible definitions? What in the Bible is called life and what in the Bible is called shalom? The Torah and following the Torah. So to be spiritually minded is to follow the Torah. To be carnally minded is death because the carnal mind is an enemy against God and the carnal mind is not subject to the Torah of God. Neither indeed can it be. So the carnal mind opposes the Torah. The carnal mind opposes the ways of God. Now, when you or I are born into this world, by default, do you know how we're programmed to go? According to our flesh and according to our carnal mind. That's the default. You don't have to teach anyone to do that. They just do it by default. But you do have to teach them um, the ways of the God of Israel so that ultimately, through the help of the Spirit of God, you can crucify the flesh and renew your mind and change the way you think. So you change from Babylonian thinking to godly thinking, to Torah or word of the God thinking. So um, I want to further outline uh, for you um, who Esau is. Um, and so if we go to Genesis in chapter 25, Genesis chapter 25, in beginning in about verse 20, and... It goes on through Esau selling his birthright the rest of the chapter. It talks about um, the birth of Jacob and Esau. And in describing um, uh, Esau, um, it says in Genesis chapter 25, verse 27, Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Esau is described as a man of the field. Now, how did Yeshua render and give the understanding and interpretation of the field? Okay, in his parable, I believe it's in uh, Mark uh, chapter uh, 13. Um, um, he says that the field is the world. He said the field is the world and bear with me for a second. Um, I think I said uh, Mark. Didn't I say Mark? Um, I meant Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 38. Yeshua said the field is the world. So Esau is a man of the field. Esau is a man of the world. So Esau is a man. All right. Remember what it says in Revelation 13 about 666? It's the number of a man. All right. Remember in Daniel? Daniel saw the image of a man. So that composite man that he saw, the image of that composite man, the name of that man is Esau. Now, to break Esau down in component parts, characteristical parts, the head of Esau is called Babylon. And the head represents how you think. And so, by default, we think according to the flesh and according to the carnal mind. By default, we think according to the Babylonian system and the Babylonian values. That's why you'll find that somebody that doesn't know the Lord, they're going to be following and believing and embracing and think the Babylonian system is correct and proper. Now, there's a word that we use in our American culture regarding this fight. Um, and oh, when those that don't know the Lord 
are fighting for their values. They call it social justice. But their social justice values aren't the values of the God of Israel. You see, it's social justice according to oh, what makes sense to the carnal mind. And it's in opposition to the ways of the God of Israel. All right, so um, what we're going to do, we're going to try to systematically break down Esau uh, because the head of, of Esau is called Babylon. The legs of Esau is called Rome. The, the, the midsection of Esau is called Greece. So if I break down him in component parts, Babylon, Greece, and Rome are called and linked with Esau, and they are daughter. Babylon is a daughter of Esau. Rome is a daughter of Esau. Greece is a daughter of Esau. So in the quote-unquote Hebraic Roots movement, there's an emphasis of coming out of Greco-Roman mindset, Greco-Roman Christianity. So when we refer to Christianity and certain practices as Greco-Roman, whether we realize it or not, we were referring to the Esau element of Christianity. All right? So, the king of Babylon, Hasatan, his agent that he works through is Esau, and the method that he works through is mixing. And so, what does the enemy then would try to do to those that believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. He's going to try to bring in mixture. Okay? So let me give you an example of mixture. Okay? And so uh, Christianity proclaims Jesus, Yeshua, He is the Messiah. And that is the truth. That's the truth, truth, and nothing but the truth. And you need to believe and accept that He is the Messiah. And Christianity is adamant that Yeshua is the Messiah and wants to tell the world that he's the Messiah and he's the Savior. And in that proclamation, it's true. They're telling the truth. They're telling the spiritual truth. Now, at the same time, they're being adamant to believe and accept that, that that's true. They're saying it is true. He was born on December 25th. But he's not born on December. It's mixture. Okay. So, um, what fundamentally did the nation of Israel do that caused the God of Israel to send them into captivity, to send them into exile? They participated in mixed worship. All right? Mixed worship. So, um, let me give you an example of mixed worship through the behavior of the northern kingdom, okay? So we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 17. And the Hebraic way of teaching is I teach by asking you questions. Now, sometimes when I ask you questions, I'm 100% sure you know the answer, but I just ask questions anyhow because it's the Hebraic way. Yeshua often made his points and he explained things by asking a question. All right? So I'm going to read a text to you and I'm going to ask you a question. It's not, tri it's not a tricky question. It's not complicated. I expect 100% uh, everybody here to know the right answer. Okay? So we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 17. And this is describing the worship of the northern kingdom. Okay? Under initially King um, Jeroboam. So, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 32. So they, speaking of the northern kingdom, so they feared the Lord. Is that good or bad? That, this is my question. I said, I, I expect you all to know. Is that good or bad? Very good. It's good. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? So, they were worshiping the God of Israel. It says it right there. They feared Yahweh. And now let's read the rest of the verse. And they made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in, in the houses of the high places. Is that good or bad? 
Notice they were doing the bad while they were expressing their worship in reverence and fear of Yahweh. They were engaged in mixed worship. Okay, so you know what the Bible does to emphasize a point? It repeats it. You know, you would do the same thing too. So let's read the next verse. So this is 2 Kings 17, verse 33. They feared Yahweh. So verse 32, so they feared Yahweh. Verse 33, they feared Yahweh. It repeats it to make the point that the people really were expressing faith and trying to express their faith in the God of Israel. Now let's read the rest of verse 33. And they served their own gods. They feared Yahweh and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from here. Is that good or bad? So notice it's mixed worship. They're doing it in context of fearing the Lord. So after it says they feared the Lord, they feared the Lord. Now let's look at the next verse. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 34. Unto this day they do after their former manners. They fear not Yahweh. Neither do they after their, their statutes or after their ordinances or after the Torah and the commandments which Yahweh commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. So it says they feared Yahweh. They feared Yahweh. And then the next verse after that says they didn't fear Yahweh. So which one was it? Uh, were they fearing Yahweh or were they not fearing Yahweh? Which one was it? So you know the good Hebrew answer is yes. They were fearing Yahweh, but at the same time they were fearing Yahweh. And the true definition of what it means to fear Yahweh, uh, to do it without mixing, they weren't doing it. So they were doing it and not doing it at the same time. Now, that doesn't logically make sense because it has to be one or the other. Black and white, clear a distinction is Greek thinking. So in Hebrew thinking, it can be both ways at the same time. So, what do you think the chapter gives you the conclusion regarding the issue? You want to hear the conclusion? It's 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 41. So these nations feared Yahweh. You see? They feared Yahweh, they feared Yahweh, and they didn't fear Yahweh and keep his Torah. So the conclusion of the chapter was, so they feared Yahweh and served their graven images both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. So, um, what is a major fundamental characteristic of the end time ministry of Elijah? Well, it's patterned after the literal ministry of Elijah. And what did he challenge the nation of Israel regarding? Baal worship. Now, if you don't study... Um, then you know what the image of your mind would be regarding what Baal worship is? And this is the image I had in my mind for many, many, many years. Is Baal worship was worshiping a different God, a different religion, a different faith other than the God of Israel. But you know what the Bible calls Baal worship? It's the mixed worship of Him He calls Baal worship. That puts it in a different light, doesn't it? So, uh, Elijah comes and challenges the people on the mixed worship. And he says, okay, you need to worship the God of Israel the way he said to be worshipped. That is, through the Torah, and you're not doing it in this particular area. Okay? So, um, that's fundamental. Now, why might it be difficult to get through to the people? that they're engaged in mixed worship. Why might that be difficult? Because they're fearing the Lord. They're fearing Yahweh. They're fearing the God of Israel. So let's make a practical example. You go to your loved ones and you say, um, when you believe that Yeshua is Messiah and you're uh, eating pork and you're celebrating Christmas and Easter, um, you're participating in customs that are not of God, not given by God. And... Uh, and you're involved in mixed worship, and you shouldn't be doing that. You know why it's difficult for them to accept what you're trying to say? You know why you get pushed back from it? Because in their heart, in their mind, in their belief, they are expressing faith in the God of Israel. They do 
believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, and they do believe that he, they do believe that um, he is their Savior. And so it's like, who are you to tell me that I'm not doing something right? And you see what happened? There's confusion. And what's caused the confusion? Mixing. Okay. So now, I just read to you what the historical northern kingdom did. And there's a, a major biblical principle that the, the rabbis express it this way. The things that happened to the forefathers foreshadows what happens to their descendants. The good Christian way to say that is biblical history's prophecy. Okay, biblical history's prophecy. So... Now, if I look at the northern kingdom, I just shared with you what they did. What did they do? They feared Yahweh, and they worshipped in the high places, which was called Baal worship. Now, we go to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. And the first time in my life I ever heard these two verses, wow, it just hit me, and it pierced my heart so. Because before the first time I heard them, I obviously hadn't heard it before. Okay, Hosea chapter 8, Hosea is written to the northern kingdom. Hosea chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. So verse 11 says, because Ephraim has made, that's past tense, because he has made many altars to sin, I just read it to you. He was making the altars to sin while he feared the Lord. Because he did, because he historically, because he literally, that was initially through King uh, Jeroboam and then the succeeding kings after him because Ephraim made altars to sin. That's what he sowed. Altars shall be unto him to sin. See, that's what he sowed. So he sowed altars to sin. So altars will be made for him to sin. So that's the prophecy. Okay, now um, I've had time to think about this. Okay, now you, you may be hearing it for the first time and and maybe trying to process it about, you know, what that means. But let me share with you what I believe it means. Do you know who made the altar that, that caused Ephraim to sin? The Roman Catholic Church. And you know what fundamentally is the name of that altar that they worship at? The doctrine of dispensationalism. And that and the, the altar of the doctrine of dispensationalism, dispensationalism says that before... Uh, Jesus or Yeshua died on the cross, died on the tree, was the age of law. And after he died on the, the tree, after he died on the cross, is the age of grace. And the age of grace replaces or supersedes the age of law so that we're not in the age of law anymore. Now, where did that altar come from? It actually came from the Roman Catholic Church, and that altar got passed to the Protestants. Because uh, have you ever thought through what what really the meaning of a what Protestant is? The root is protest, and it's short for a protesting Catholic. I, I'm telling you the truth. A, a Protestant means a protesting Catholic. It means you're still a Catholic. You're just a protesting Catholic. Okay, because many of the practices that's in the Protestant world they inherited. And came from Rome. And now I'm going to show you who Rome is by, by further explaining to you characteristics of Esau. So, um, it says, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And so, how you would pronounce the word in Hebrew is Seir. Seir. All right, so I want you to notice um, that the place where Esau lived, say ear. Now the Strong's number is 8165, and it says it's, it's written or it's uh, like 8163. All right, 8165, 8163. So, so now in describing Esau in Genesis 27 verse 11, it says, Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. You, you see the word hairy? It's 8163. Now let me remind you, because sometimes this information goes fast. I've been told more than one time in, 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 in my teachings the last 20 years that sometimes listening to you is like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. All right, so 
being aware of that, sometimes I like to step back and say, okay, if you feel like you're drinking water of a fire hydrant, I'll go back and remind you. All right? So, Esau dwelt in Mount Seir, 8165, and it says Seir is, uh, in Hebrew, fundamentally the same as 8163. Now, 8163 got translated as Harry in describing Esau. And so 8163 is Sa'ir. So he lived in Sa'ir, and the word Harry is Sa'ir. All right? Now, I want to show you another example of the word that describes Esau, which is translated as Harry in Genesis 27 11. Sa'ir, 8163, and in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 7, and you will take the two goats. See the word goats? 8163. And so the same word describing Esau, translated as Harry in Genesis 27, 11, is translated in Leviticus 16, verse 7, as a goat. So this tells you that biblically, through the Hebrew, that Esau is characteristically associated with a goat. All right? 8163. So now in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 7, it says, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices the devils. So now 8163, which described Esau as a hairy man, that the previous verse I showed you translated as a goat. Here it's translated as devils. So in the Hebrew, it's spelled the same. So fundamentally, Esau is characteristically associated with goat, and both of those two things are characteristically associated with Hasatan. Now, if you understand the association, remember in Matthew chapter 25 that Yeshua said he was going to divide between the sheep and the goats? Now, who in the Bible is called sheep? His people. Jacob. And so now who is the goat? It's Esau. So he's going to separate Jacob from Esau. No, what he's really separating is the characteristics of someone who is spiritually Jacob Israel versus someone who is, has the characteristics and behaviors uh, and, and spiritually aligns with Esau. All right. So 8163, once again, 8163 was translated as Harry in Genesis 27, 11, translated as goat, Leviticus 16, 7, translated as devils in Leviticus 17, 7. And now in Daniel chapter 8, verse 21, it says the rough goat is the king of Greece. So here it's translated as rough. And so now, since that word is linked with Esau, um, Esau now is associated with Greece. Esau is associated with Greece. And what is one of the major things we associate and connect Greece with? Democracy. Okay? Democracy is the government of Esau. It's not the government of God. What is the government of God? Kingship, a theocracy. Okay? And what if you don't agree with the ways of the king in the theocracy? You might think that his ways are unfair. Right? You might think his ways are unfair because he doesn't accept your thoughts or your viewpoint or your perspective. And not only does it, might he not agree with your thought, your perspective, your view... But he, but the person beside me, who also has a thought, a perspective of you, perhaps should be considered just as well as mine, just as well as somebody else's. And so the real social justice system is you consider and you uh, 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 take to heart the views of everybody because everybody's views has value. And it's not just your way. Not just the way the king. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 so the Babylonian view of the king is he's a dictator because, you know, he's a king. And uh, what do you do if 
you don't agree or don't want to follow his ways. Well, the king happens to also be the judge. Now what do you got to do? He's the Supreme Court. Now what do you got to do? All right, so they, so the Babylonian Esau perspective is, you know, that's unfair. That's unjust. You see? So now do you see how a rebellion could come? And so, you know how I know, even though the scripture doesn't literally say that that is a argument that Hasatan used in the rebellion? Because Hasatan uses the same tactics now that he uses then. So the same thing he's doing now is what he did then. So if I see what his arguments are now, that's what his arguments are then. And part of his tactics is now is, you all should have a vote. But um, are you guys old enough to know how the American political system works? Uh, because Matthew explained it to you, you know, when he spoke up here, um, you know, being the first speaker. Um, they make you think you have a vote, but you know how really have a vote? Your vote really doesn't count because no matter what you say, you know, we're going to get people in office who you really can't directly vote for, and they're going to make decisions, and we don't care what you thought when you voted. We're going to do it our way anyhow. So they make you think that you have a voice, but in reality, you really don't have a voice. You know what that's called? Deception. <laughs> and so Esau operates by deception. So now, remember that famous book of Obadiah? Um, it's a prophecy regarding Esau or Edom. Obadiah 1.1. 1, 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus says Yahweh Elohim, concerning Edom. And then it goes on to say about Edom or Esau, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 11, in the day that you stood on the other side, now, now, notice Esau is associated with the other side. Now, what do you think would be the opposite of the other side? The right side. Because remember when uh, Yeshua separated the sheep from the goats? Um, the goats was on what side? The left. It was on the left. The sheep was on the right. And so the other side is the left. And God's side is the right. So, remember uh, after Yeshua's resurrection and the, the disciples hadn't caught anything all night? What did he tell them to do? Put the net on the right side. Okay. So, in the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners enter into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, you were one of them. In, the, in the, the day that Jerusalem went under siege, went into captivity, Esau, you were one of them. Now, biblically speaking, um, who do we associate with um, Jerusalem going into captivity? First, the Babylonians, and then in the first century, the Romans. Okay, So fundamentally, Esau now is going to be associated with Babylon, and Esau is going to be associated with Rome. So Esau is Babylonian, Greco, Roman. So how is the United States government, how is it structured? Well, it's a democratic republic. Now, um, part of the understanding of a republic is everybody has certain fundamental rights. It's called the uh, the Bill of Rights, but within the Republic, there's a democratic aspect to it. So where did democracy come from? Greece, in our modern world. I'm calling modern the last 2,500 years. Okay, where did the, the Republic element of governmental function and rule come from? It came from Rome. So do you, do you see the pillars there of, of our governmental building? Where did those pillars come from? They come from Rome. And we even have churches, particularly Baptist churches. How normally are they built? With the Roman pillar. And, and, what, and, and what do you do when you enter the church? You have to walk underneath that pillar. And, and uh, you're in essence making a prophetic act that you're coming under the authority of Rome. I think this is a good time to take a 15 minute break. Because that's the, that is a, a uh, an overview um, that I wanted to uh, share with you first as a foundation, and now we'll 
We'll try to build on that foundation after we take our break, okay?